Thank you for joining us and welcome to Amplified Wealth's According to Plan, where Tom Farrell and I, Kate Fishbein, discuss uh, various financial planning topics. Today's focus is the upcoming expiration of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, aka TCJA, and its potential changes. The TCJA signed into law by Trump in 2017 will expire at the stroke of midnight on December 31st, 2025, possibly reverting many tax code changes to their pre-2017 state. Today, we'll highlight key individual tax rate changes, but please note that this is not an exhaustive list of all the TCJA changes. And we are thrilled to have a guest today. And maybe, Tom, if you could do the honors of introducing our guest. Absolutely. Um, so our guest today is Lynn Musensky Keck. Uh, she is a principal, a tax principal with over 20 years of experience in the accounting profession and serves as the national lead on federal tax policy at Witham, a top 25 public accounting firm. She specializes in federal, domestic, and international tax planning for businesses and individuals. Lynn is a licensed CPA in the state of New York and a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Excited Absolutely. to talk. <laughs> Thanks so for we, being here. We know that you were recently in, uh, in D.C., uh, as you often are. So can you tell us more about your experience last week? Yeah. So I, I was able to go to D.C. last week. I'll return again in June. I, I probably go at least once a quarter and um, focusing on the need for tax reform. Um, you may or may not be aware there's been a, a significant change in research and experimental expenditures that um, actually went into play um, in 2022. And so I've um, been a big advocate uh, of, of getting that uh, potentially back to immediate expensing instead of capitalizing. And then obviously um, working with various leaders in the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee regarding this potential sunset of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was referred to earlier. So um, a lot of interesting things going on in, in, in that area right now. Um, well, and it's a, and it's ahead, a big Kate, change. It's a big change and it's going to affect a lot of, you know, certainly individuals. And that's really going to be our focus today mm -hmm. for sure. Should we start walking through maybe just some of these potential changes? I think let's start with an overall picture of, of if you don't mind, of why yeah, we're here. Sure. Um, and then we can talk about a little bit more, um, you know, setting the, the, the 10,000 foot picture before going diving into specifics. Um, so you might say, why are we talking about a bill that passed in 2017 and mm -hmm. in 2024? And I think, um, you know, it is important to realize why we have these things called the sunset provision. So many people would sit there and say, why are we, why do they sunset? So a really important thing to highlight, um, as pointed out earlier, is that if they do nothing, it goes away. This is not saying they're debating whether to repeal it. Um, and essentially that occurred because they couldn't pass it as law. Um, they use something called a budget reconciliation process. And I think it's really important for um, people to understand what that means, um, because it most likely will be, again, what we see going forward um, for purposes of, of tax reform. So to pass a law, um, you need at least uh, 60 votes in the Senate. And as we become more and more um, uh, not partisan uh, or more and more partisan, not bipartisan, um, we're seeing that being uh, an extreme challenge in the Senate. And so what they do is they, um, as everybody is most likely aware, uh, Congress kind of controls the purse strings um, regarding um, the checks and balances. And one of the ways that they can push tax legislation through is through a process called budget reconciliation. And a budget reconciliation only requires you to have 51 votes in the Senate and essentially will allow you to implement certain policies that would Im impact revenue, um, but only for a set period of time. Meaning you can only say, you know, for the next eight years, I'm only gonna increase the deficit by X. Um, and to do that, they obviously needed to include sunset provisions. Um, I, I, I like to point out, um, you know, the deficit yeah. they were they agreed to was one point eight trillion dollars through fiscal year twenty twenty eight. So we are it, it's a significant amount um, that is being added to the the federal deficit, um, which then makes it even more challenging to understand what will happen with this going further. 
Um, but I do like to point out to many people who say, well, I'm sure they're going to extend it, right? I'm sure we're going to keep lower tax rates for individuals. I'm sure, um, you know, we're going to keep that high ex exemption amount um, for estates and gifts. And I would say I wouldn't be so sure. That's kind of my caution to everyone who's listening today, because within that bill, there were already mechanisms to draw down um, and, and increase taxes that have gone into effect that no one thought would go into effect. And so, for example, if you're a business, small business, you might be aware of something called bonus depreciation. That was always 100% historically. It went down to 80% in 2023. It's down to 60% this year. Uh, it would be at 40% next year. And there's been no revisions to that, right? So they've allowed that to what I would say sunset. Um, they've also essentially had a provision in there that said, all your research and experimental expenditures, they've always in U.S. history been immediately deductible. But as part of this need to uh, have this budget offset within a window period, um, they essentially said no longer can you immediately expense them. You have to capitalize them. They've also, um, you know, tightened how um, you calculate your interest expense limitation in the business world. So all three of those things, I would say, are in effect now um, and are similar to these sunset provisions we're going to talk about today. Um, just to really make sure that people are understanding, like, this is not a slam dunk. Um, I think a lot of people have that perception, especially with the research and experimental expenditures. And it is important to be active in this space. And it is important to understand the implications that could happen to you because they could be um, quite significant. Thank you for that, Lynn. That, that was incredibly insightful um, and, you know, very, very helpful, I think, for our listeners to know. And, you know, when, when the committees are looking at the expense of maybe, you know, extending some of these deductions and changes, what is typically the term that they're looking at, Lynn? Is it more shorter term? Are they looking at any of the longer term implications? Because there's always that debate that, you know, lower tax cuts. Yeah, maybe maybe there's that initial hit in the beginning, but maybe it offers longer, better longer term economic growth. Right. Are they trying to balance the two? Right. I think it's a great question. And it really it brings us to another large piece that we have to be monitoring when we're talking about tax refer reform is federal tax reform is a direct impact right on the federal budget. Obviously, we have to bring revenue in to spend it. And um, the Congressional Budget Office is kind of tasked to understand, are we within line of where we need to be um, and where we want to be um, with our deficit and, and other pieces of how we operate as a government? And to your point, um, I think it's really interesting that they have already come out and been very clear that if we extend this legislation, um, these sunset provisions from 2025 to 20, 2034, they're expecting us to increase the deficit by five trillion dollars. Um, and just for reference, our deficit this year, right in the prior year, was 1.7 trillion. So that, that's a significant addition, right, um, during that time period. And that's why many people are saying, um, you know, we have three options here. We let them sunset, which is my caution to you. We've right. seen it before, it could happen again. This is real. Um, they do nothing, right? Um, the second option is they, they do an extender bill. Um, for a couple of years, which again is going to be very challenging from a, a, a congressional budget office perspective because of the significant um, debt uh, that the U.S. takes on if that occurs. Um, or um, they, we do major tax reform. And I, I think, you know, we highlight yesterday and, and throughout our times uh, monitoring this year is that major tax reform is hard enough when you have, you know what you're working with. Um, major tax reform will be extremely challenging because we have November elections, right? We don't even know who might be heading up our Senate Finance Committee, um, the majority leader, because it's, it would it potentially switch to a Republican leader. Is the House going to stay Republican or are they going to switch to Democrat? And then obviously what's going on in the White House? Um, and Biden's been very, President Biden has been very clear what he expects um, what his budget proposal is surrounding these, right. these areas. So I just think, um, you know, there is no clear cut answer. And I think, again, highlighting, um, you know, this could go at one of those three ways. Um, people obviously would want tax reform. I think it's going to be really major tax reform. I think it's going to be really challenging to get to that place. And so to your point, will they just say extend it for a couple of years or, or will they say we don't, we just don't have the breath 
um, in our in our budget in our federal budget to, to do that. And so we're going to let these sunset. Yeah. I mean, sunsetting is the easiest thing when you think about government. Um, when we're very um, when we're not bipartisan, we're very partisan. You know, if they can't get to an agreement and they don't push anything forward, um, the law says these these options go away, um, and and that could be a reality as well. Sure. Yeah, and it might be tough to get stuff stuff through. So I guess the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah, is not then, something individuals and businesses like to hear. <laughs> no, it does. It makes it it makes it difficult to make decisions and plans, but I think it's important to be aware of, you know, what's going on, the potential changes and and just having these things on your on your horizon. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, you know, one of the things that we continue to talk about internally is you know, all those challenges you talked about, Lynn, um, and how do we how do we communicate that with with clients? Right. This is such a chaotic when I think about it. You know, I talk to folks, um, you know, in the in the accounting world about, you know, that what what if they let it sunset? Um, how much scrambling will there be? Um, because it's going to be a last minute decision, most likely, like they like they did when they actually passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act at the very end of 2017, sure. right before yeah. Christmas. Um, you know, so if, I'm just thinking about the potential chaos of, of uh, you know, getting tax returns done in 2026 and, and things like that. So or even, you know, the, the year after that. But uh, from a planning standpoint, that's why we're here. Right. This is mm -hmm. this is our according to plan uh, podcast. So, you know, we do want to make sure that we're communicating with clients now. I do think that the uh, the time to start to make sure that that folks are aware of what these potential changes could look like is in 2024. I think if we wait to 2025, we're too late. Um, not too late to do anything, but just too late in terms of r people really making a, um, a concerted effort to, to put a plan in, in place that makes sense for their personal situation. So uh, to Kate's point, we do want to chat about, uh, you know, how a lot of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act does impact uh, individuals, high net worth individuals, uh, and even business owners, uh, especially pass through entities. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but we do have uh, uh, our agenda slide. Uh, first and foremost, you know, individual income tax rates. Sure. And, and the one thing, Tom, that I think, you know, we saw certainly with the marginal tax rates is that TCJA, for the most part, you know, lowered, lowered those marginal tax rates. I'll just highlight a couple of brackets just to kind of show, you know, across the board what some of those rates were and the different income levels. Because I think the one thing that we're going to see if TCJA does sunset is not only are the marginal rates going to be higher, but you can potentially get there faster. So meaning that, you know, at, at different brackets, you know, that that you're going to get to that next income level, that next bracket much quicker. So, you know, for currently, um, let's take married filing jointly for over 731,000 approximately in income. That's currently a 37 percent rate. That is set to sunset at 39.6% come 2026. Uh, for incomes over 585,000, excuse me, for married filing jointly. So, you know, getting there faster and at a higher rate. And then let's just take, I think it's something like 80% of folks filing tax returns uh, report incomes of about 100,000 or less. So, you know, focusing on that 12 to 22 percent, you know, looking at the current 22 percent bracket for someone married filing jointly, um, you know, under 200,000 or so in income, currently 22 percent. That would go up to 25 uh, percent for folks with 190,000 in income or less. And then at that 12 percent rate currently, that is, um, you know, income of around 94,000 or less. Um, and that would go up to about 15%, but no change on that income bracket. So these could be significant. Um, so something definitely to, for folks to, to keep an eye on. Yeah, and I think, you know, to your point, it, it is important to realize that we have a graduated system, right? So yes. your movement from 22 to 25 or that 3% increase is going to occur even if you're over that bracket amount, right? Um, yeah. and, and in addition, ignore and we'll talk about it later 199a what have you effectively um for anyone who's making over um the the, the projected amounts which is uh 520 if you're single or 580,000 if you're married you know they're going to be seeing essentially a three percent effective tax rate increase 
um, flat out, right? So yeah. it's very, it's very um, daunting because we're going to talk about two things going on here. One, we're talking about you know, the actual taxable income, is that becoming bigger or smaller based on policy? And then what rates are we applying to that taxable income? Um, and so you can see a significant adjustment. Um, Biden's been even more clear um, in his proposal uh, as of late um, that he wants that 39.6% bracket to start at 400,000. Um, because remember, that's his kind of push. Biden's saying, I'm not going to raise taxes for anyone who is single who makes 400 or married filing joint who makes 450. Um, but for everyone else in that above and beyond that bracket area, I, I'm definitely going to going to raise some taxes. So um, something to be watchful is that this is what happens if it sunsets. But if the Democrats, um, you know, get the, the proposal that Biden have, has out there, it could be even even more impactful to, to right. a variety of people. I was going to say, Lynn, when you when you're chatting with folks in D.C., how much are like, do you have conversations about these these particular pieces of, of the puzzle here in terms of like the brackets and whatnot? Any whispers right now in terms of what you've heard, just in terms of what the thought process looks like for going yeah. back to these rates? Yeah, I think um, it's very again, Democrats want to move back to these rates. Republicans um obviously don't. There's a philosophy, um, right, difference. Um, and and I'm, we are completely um, bipartisan here. But when you look at, um, you know, Democrats are saying we want to collect the money and utilize the money to make the U.S. better. Um, you know, Republicans tend to think leave the money with the people, right, and the people will innovate and utilize the money and, and um, make the U.S. better. And so that's still very much the overall arcing um, philosophies of both parties. And so you, you can see that implemented in, in, in this type of decision-making process. And to be honest with you, a lot of our focus has been on the, on the business side, um, in, in hopes that we can clarify what's going on with our pass-through income before we start talking about now, what, how does it going to impact it, the individuals? Um, but it is, you know, obviously, um, I think we talked about a little bit uh, yesterday, uh, the head of the House Ways and Means Committee has indeed put in what they call tax teams that are addressing all of these sunsetting provisions and trying to gather information um, and develop proposals to figure out how best um, they can be addressed in the upcoming year. Well, that's good. So they're taking action now. They're thinking ahead. <laughs> they're not watching this podcast and, oh, my gosh, we got to get on this. They're already. <laughs> I Maybe they should. The yeah. House is taking action. The okay. Senate has not done a similar process as of yet. So there does seem to be some tension even amongst uh, the parties. Right. Even the Republican leader. Um, you know, there was seemed to be some tension in the last 12 months between um, the head of the House Ways and Means Committee, um, Jason Smith, and uh, the ranking committee member of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Senator um, Crapo. You know, they they don't seem to be aligned quite yet. Um, it's even been reported that the Republican House uh, Smith works better um, with Wyden, who is the Senate Finance C Committee leader on the Democratic side. So I'm really I'm watching that relationship closely because it does take both yeah. sides of the House to get these through. You know, we, we saw it this year. We saw an un, un um, wavering support of, of a tax bill where there was very overwhelming support, very few re representatives that voted against it. And it died in the Senate. You know, so that's my fear is do we do all this work in the House? But if the Senate's not in lockstep with us and how we're approaching it and what what the conclusions are, are we really going to see it come to fruition? That's right. my concern. That working together piece is always key for sure. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, neat. So let's talk about the standard deduction, because that's another big change that's that's potentially coming down the road. And TCJA effectively almost doubled you know, the standard deduction. Um, and I'll, I'll go over the rates as well. But, you know, I think what we saw is that more and more folks just took the standard deduction because it was higher than what their itemized deductions would have been. And in a way, maybe that simplified things for folks, um, you know, fewer receipts to collect, fewer deductions to kind of keep track of what might, might what might I be eligible for. So in a way, maybe that was simpler. And just to go over what those amounts were and what they might revert back to, and we won't know the def you know, definitive amount because ultimately, you know, these will probably be adjusted for inflation, presuming, right, Lynn? Yes. 
But pre-TCJA, I'll focus on the single taxpayer since I did married filing jointly on my last slide. You know, pre-TCJA, uh, the single taxpayer, the deduction was 6,500 standard deduction. In 2018, with the passing of TCJA, that went up to 12,000. That's now been inflated up to 14,600 for tax year 2024. So certainly, you know, that's, that is a, a good chunk to take off, you know, as a standard deduction. So, and again, I see that that's why more and more folks were taking the standard deduction over itemizing because sometimes your, item, your, your itemization isn't going to get you to that level all the time. So, yeah. And to be honest with you, this was a, this was a win-win, right? This was a win for taxpayers from the perspective of, okay, it's high enough where it might be close to what I used to itemize on, but it really was a big win for the IRS and their ability to have to conduct audits on itemized deductions, right? Right. If you have a standard deduction, they can't challenge it, right? They don't need to tick and tie to it. They don't need to be concerned about uh, potential manipulation. Um, and so this was, you know, I think that the stats came in that over 90% of US taxpayers were taking the standard deduction with these increased rates. Um, wow. And so that was really nice, obviously from a variety of angles. But I think that what's interesting is, like you said, they said, well, the standard deduction is higher now, primarily because we capped a lot of the benefits in the itemized deduction arena. Um, whether it were, I know we're going to talk about those in a little bit, but so yes, it very, you very well could be back to tracking down your investment expenses, tracking down right. your charitable contributions, um, and, and mortgage insurance, et cetera, um, coming, um, if the TCJA sunsets. That tax folder is only going to get thicker. Yeah. Yeah. And there's and also, the yeah I was going to say, there's also a, like a, there's a mindset for taxpayers who, you know, folks that are, you know, paying interest on their mortgage, making charitable contributions and things like that from a tax standpoint, you know, from a from a do I get the deduction or not mindset? People are like, oh, I'm not getting I'm not getting the benefit here from a tax standpoint. Um, but they but at the same time, Lynn, to your point, you know, they got a big bump here in, in the standard deduction amount. So that there still is a mindset uh, about, you know, the, the virtues of am I getting a benefit for the interest I'm paying in my mortgage and, and, and things like that. So. But we do have a whole slide about itemized deductions, and it really kind of highlights the complexity yes. about how this worked. And, you know, it, 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 it's interesting, too, because I remember the, um, you know, just the uh, all the, the commentary uh, and the pushback from high tax states when the legislation was pushed through and trying to figure out how are people going to be able to navigate this and, uh, and all that. And, and some of the you know, uh, taxpayers pushing their representatives to go back to Washington and, and really push for a change and whatnot. Fast forward, it's still in place, uh, but we may see our itemized deductions, you know, come back if, again, if Congress does nothing between now and the end of 2025. Um, but to Kate's point, some of the things that they really put a cap on here for high tax states, you know, folks that live in New York, California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and whatnot. We have we certainly have a lot of clients in, in those areas. You know, the the, the cap on uh, state and local income taxes of ten thousand dollars. I know, you know, New Jersey, highest property ta tax state in in the union. Uh, you know, your property taxes alone could be you know well more than double that ten thousand dollar cap. Never mind what what income taxes you're paying to the to the state of New Jersey or. Or New York. So that was a big, big change um, through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Yeah, I think the the one, and it was painful, right? It was very painful. We had to yes. then see what states. So essentially, what we're talking about is under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, um, they they capped how much state and local taxes you could deduct for your itemized deduction. So before we'd look at property taxes, real um, um, school taxes, we'd look at our state income tax which obviously is predominantly higher, generally on the East and the West Coast. Um, and they said, okay, we used to be able to gather all of those and deduct the total gamut. And then they said, well, no, just kidding, cap it at $10,000, which was a, it's a, a huge issue. Um, a couple of things I would note here is it gets really complex and something we've never really seen before um, in the fact that then the states for pass through entities, because the argument was, why do the C corporations get to keep taking their state and local tax deduction? But we as a pass through entity, like a partnership or S Corp don't. Um, and so all these states started developing a way, a mechanism, which generally is referred to as pass through entity tax um, to, to get that deduction 
on the federal line without it going through an itemized deduction. Um, and so there's a lot of interplay here with this mm -hmm. particular item um, because to the, ex we'll talk about later AMT, but to the extent I can pay my pass through entity tax and have it flow through my first page of my 1040 or my, or my ordinary income, um, I'm not having an AMT add back and I'm not probably jumping into AMT like I would, right, if I indeed took the total amount as a itemized deduction. And so there's a lot of, you know, it's not, you know, when we talk about rates, it's easy to say, okay, that's going up 3%. But there's a lot of give and pull when these sunset uh, of how how it's going to interact with other deductions or income items on your tax return. Uh, it's not necessarily black and white. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of gray there for sure. And, it, you know, it really kind of highlights everybody's unique individual circumstance, uh, depending on what is relevant to them and what's not and, and how the new law impacted their bottom line, if you will, to your point. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, the, uh, you know, the other thing in terms of just, you know, charitable contributions that, you know, we have one of the bullet points on the page here, you know, they they made some updates to, you know, how much you can deduct, uh, you know, against your AGI uh, that will re re revert back. Not a huge uh, change there, but. I think from a you know standard deduction being much higher standpoint, a, a lot of the focus the last uh, several years has been you know more more of a calculated approach to if you were going to make a charitable contribution, mm -hmm. perhaps you do it in a year where you're bunching several years worth of normal gifting into one let's say high tax year, get over that standard deduction hurdle, and use something like a donor advised fund to um, to kind of front load uh, several years worth of normal uh, contributions together. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of how that plays out uh, in the future, but certainly donor advised funds have become you know, a very popular way for folks to be able to um, harness their, their charitable inclination um, and be able to kind of manage that going forward for, for their families. And I would point out there, what I, the reason for the increase to 60% was there's a fear there was going to be a drop in people giving to charity because they were losing the tax benefit, hmm. right? Um, but essentially, um, you know, it was surprising to me. I also believe that, right? That people, I guess people aren't as nerdy as I am, right? When calculating my charitable deductions on how much that impacts <laughs> from a tax perspective. Um, but uh, it, they really did not see a correlation, which which did, um, meaning that they did wow. not see that charitable contributions went down. Um, obviously, like you talked about the donor advised fund, that's a great planning opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, using your required minimum distributions, right, is another yes. great planning opportunity to still get the deduction. Um, but, um, it, you know, obviously, um, charitable deductions and the ability um, to, to, you know, harness that easier if the TCGA sunsets um, will be there again. And I think there was even a COVID provision. I think it was 2020 or 2021 where they actually raised it to 100 percent of AGI deduction yep. just yep. for that one particular year. Yep. So, they, yeah, they, they, they did make some updates uh, along the way there. Um, but, um, it, you know, the, I think the, the other piece, I think, Lynn, that you had mentioned just briefly before was this other you know miscellaneous itemized deduction section um, that uh, that folks were were used to using prior to the uh, to the tax act. Um, and some of the p pieces that would be highlighted there would be things like, you know, your tax prep fees, your investment advisory fees, uh, unreimbursed employee business expenses, things like that, where people were really keeping track of, um, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, those you. those line items. Right. Uh, yeah. For when it comes to tax prep and, and those, you know, those could be coming back if again, if, if nothing is done in, in Congress. So let's chat about that AMT uh, briefly. So, you know, we don't want to do a deep dive here into AMT, but we think that this, um, you know, this this visual here, this graphic does a great job of showing the impact of the changes that were made to how the AMT operated uh, through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, you know, one of the things to highlight was a frustration out there that there was no inflation adjustment going up to the the beginning of the tax cuts and jobs act for amt so more and more tax filers you know were being subject to amt because they weren't increasing that um that exemption amount for inflation uh, more more and more people were getting trapped if you will uh for this parallel tax uh that we call the amt and then you know through the tax cuts and jobs act you can see that that basically just bottomed out uh and this is a this is a graph from the tax policy center um, and what they're doing here is they're they're making some estimates, some projections of, about you know what the AMT 
um, could look like. If, again, if, if nothing is done and, and we do get a sunset here, you know, how, how that will impact taxpayers moving forward. Um, so I think from folks that are watching uh, on YouTube here, great, great visual just to kind of get an impact here of AMT. Uh, Lynn, any further thoughts on, um, on AMT and what you're hearing? Uh, AMT is not our friends, right? <laughs> no, it is not. Um, and, you know, it, it is um, going to be significant. I think a lot of us um, have seen that AMT wasn't applicable because of these increased exemption amounts and, and, and tweaking of how it was ac actually calculated. Um, I think the estimate, so similarly, I was reviewing similar graphics. Um, they're saying if it goes back into effect, it will impact 8 million taxpayers. And by the time you get to 2032, it's going to impact 10. Um, so this is, it's it, it, it's not a fun um place to be to tell your clients they're an AMT. It was a welcomed relief. Um, but again, I think it's going to be dictated on who's who's running the policy, because this is something very much that the, the Democrats would support. Yeah. Great. And, and could you explain a little, uh, Lynn, just why more folks might be subject to AMT? It's my right. understanding that a lot of those, you know, like the SALT deduction and certain types of income actually get added back in because the AMT is that parallel tax system that's calculating, you know, the, your, your tax obligation. Right. So it's a minimum tax that they're essentially saying, um, we allow you these deductions for your regular tax liability, how you calculate it. But these deductions, we want you paying at least a minimum tax rate, right? And so by switching them to AMT, they still start with your taxable income. But as you pointed out, um, they'll add back that state and local tax deduction, right? They'll add back your charitable deductions and they'll say, okay, I'm comparing this new number to an exemption amount. And the TCJA, that exemption amount was quite high. So it, not a lot of people got in there. So going back to that, this, you know, pre-TCJA rule, we're going to see people taking the SALT deduction, right? right. Uh, again, not being capped. So that's going to be a big add back. We might not be as um, thoughtful on our charitable donations with, with donor advised funds, et cetera, because, you know, we're not being, we don't need to group at all into one year. So that's going to be an add back. And then now they're saying the exemption amount is going to, you know, drop back to pre-TCJA levels, which is just wow. um, too, too small uh, um, to really help a variety of people. Wow. Yeah. So, so could continue to be, uh, you know, a surprise for a lot of folks. Certainly. Any, any whispers, uh, AMT specifically that you've been hearing recently, Lynn at all? Um, there's been a lot of talk about AMT kind of in the, in the corporate world, as you know, primarily, um, corporate AMT has gone to the wayside. Right. And, and we're going to, we'll see that, um, as we discuss more and more that the corporate provisions were kind of permanent and these individual provisions and pass through provisions were more um, sunsetting. And so um, what what I think would be a logical um, kind of conclusion amongst the parties is AMT will come back. Um, but essentially that exemption amount has to be raised. We can't go back to pre TCJA non-inflationary amounts. It's just, especially as you all know, the way inflation has been working, um, through the sure. system, um, right. of, of, you know, just not the economy, but the other areas of the tax code. Yeah. It's interesting. AMT is one of those things where, you know, we're talking about tax reform as a whole, right? That 30,000 foot level view, mm -hmm. uh, but AMT itself has been up for debate in terms of its own reform for, for many years. So I can, I can see potentially maybe there's some traction on, on some meaningful AMT reform. We'll, we'll see how that, that looks, but it does also highlight the interplay, right? Between all these moving pieces right. for taxpayers. And I think, um, you know, one of the next topics we, we wanted to chat about is the, um, uh, the qualified business income deduction section 199A, um, that affected pass through business entities like LLCs, S corporations and, and partnerships. I know Lynn, that you wanted to chat uh, a little bit about, you know, what, what this means. And, you know, we all know that the, co the corporate tax rate was reduced, um, down to 21% or so. I think it was, was it, uh, as high as 39% or 35%? 35. Yeah. Before that. Right. And yeah. then I think they made this quote unquote permanent. You know, as in everything from Congress is "quote unquote" permanent, uh, down to twenty-one percent or so, uh, and we'll see. You know what what debate uh, takes form in terms of what that might change to, but but certainly for pass-through entities where you know these these are the, the types of business where the where the income flows through the individual's tax return, there needed to be some adjustments through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 
Um, and, and that's where 199A came from. Yeah, I think I could talk about this probably for four hours. This is <laughs> something I'm so passionate about. And overall, I will tell the listeners, um, again, don't assume that this is just going to be provided again. Um, mm. One of the things you have to keep in mind is because there's such extreme turnover in the in Congress, there aren't a lot of people um, in the House and the Senate that who pass the TCJA that are still there. So meaning when you talk about why was 199A enacted and should it still exist, we're in an education session right now with our representatives and our senators of explaining what it is and why it still needs to exist. And ultimately, it, it, it's to allow a level, a more level playing field, I should say, um, for how a C corporation operates versus how pastor entities operate. So to your point, Tom, the C corporation came out and they said flat tax at 21 percent did hurt some small C corporations, but mainly benefited many for for partnerships. One of the reasons this would not have passed is because the pass through entity world were, were very anti like you're giving them a tax rate of 14 percent reduction. What about us? <laughs> Why you moved us from thirty nine point six percent to thirty seven. But that's not even close in comparing to what you just did for the large C corporation. Yeah, big whoop, right? Big yeah. whoop. Really? Um, so they, you know, you will probably all know that not everybody can take a 199A deduction. Accounting firms don't get it. Um, but the, a variety of people do get it. And so essentially what it does, I'm going to say it, and I want you to listen to this, because this is probably going to be the most impactful to any of you who own a pass through entity. Our tax rate right now is 37% maximum. When we get this 20% kind of fictitious deduction, we es essentially make our effective tax rate 30%, okay? So for every dollar I'm earning, provided it's eligible for 199A, assuming I'm at the maximum tax rate, the maximum um, in uh, tax is gonna be applied for my, my business is, is 30%, closer to the 21%. Um, don't get me involved in a double taxation at the C corporation level, because I think many people would be surprised that oftentimes um, C corporation for, for large C corporations, uh, the shareholders themselves aren't taxable. So a 21% rate is indeed being um, gained by many. Um, but on the opposite side now, so you're saying, okay, Lynn's telling me I'm at a 30% rate. So what if 199A goes away and the individual income tax rate goes up to 39.6%? your effective tax rate, right, is going to jump 10%, right? You're going to go wow. from a 30% wow. for your income you're earning from your business to 40%. So um, you're going to see a 25% increase. It's significant. Wow. Okay? Right. Um, some people have called this um, tax loopholes. You know, it's you know, it's not a tax loophole, um, but some people are saying it's only for the rich, um, there's a, there's just surprisingly to me, this started about 18 months ago. I was hearing negative connotations towards this 199A deduction when I would go to DC, which was surprising to me because it's supposed to help our small businesses, sure, right? Right. Um, and our privately owned businesses who gener who are much, um, uh, more we're surrounded by them and employ many of people, right? More so than our multinational large. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, this is going to be a battle. We've already started this battle. Um, there's actually a bill that's already been represented in the House that has, um, we've been getting signatures in the House and Senate for support. Um, but this is my biggest fear because it really would be um, a game changer. And, and I think, for, you know, potentially force many people to really analyze switching into a C-Corp, which for medium to small businesses is very challenging. It's just, it, it requires a lot more, um, uh, administrative items to take care of if you're in a C-Corp. Um, right, so, so more costly, more, more costly, costly for small business. Right. So another tax in a way, right? Right. Gosh. So, um, yeah, this is something definitely to keep your eye on. 10% um, increase in your federal rate is just, it, it's unheard of. And, and, I, and I'm very fearful that it, it could happen. Well, we're hoping that the uh, the education that you and your colleagues are providing, <laughs> uh, our representatives in D.C. Uh, is sinking in because, as you pointed out, you know this is this is a big one, um, and there's not a lot of time left. And if, if you think about all the normal planning that a business has to do, never mind the tax part of it. Right now, they have to worry about that on top of everything else. 
it's it's I think it's going to be you know these next eighteen months are going to be um, you know pretty pretty busy pretty exciting. heavy. Yeah. Exciting. Yes. A lot to watch and to look out for, for sure. All right. Let's let's switch gears. Uh, our final topic here, uh, you know, a lot of our uh, of our clients uh, are talking about, OK, what are, what are we expecting in terms of the federal gift and estate tax exemption? Uh, there's been some massive movements in the exemption amounts through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, this this graph um, is a is a nice way just to kind of give a, a visual of where the exemptions were before the Tax Act. Mm-hmm. On the left-hand side, that's 2017 and prior. Um, those exemptions were, call it roughly, you know, $5 million per person, $10 million for a married couple. Uh, and then they were extended through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where right now the exemption is all the way up to $13.61 million per person, right? So over $27 million for a married couple. And if, again, if nothing is done, those are sl- slated to essentially be cut in half with an adjustment for inflation. Most folks that we talk to um, are assuming that that exemption amount would roughly be about $7 million per person come 2026 uh, if we do sunset. So, you know, that, that's a, it's a big, big change. And there's really only about 18 months left of this, what we call bonus um, exemption amount. And... So one of the things we're just curious about, Lynn, is, you know, what are you hearing in D.C. in terms of the thought process here? Because it was such a big change. Um, Again, kind of like the AMT exemption amounts being blown out as much as they were. Um, You know, what what uh, what rumblings are you hearing in terms of the estate tax uh, exemption? Uh the Democrats are very much so saying they want it back to, to mm-hmm. the $5 million you know, kind of range where it, it previously existed. Um, Pr- President Biden's plan is very clear on that, um, that they want to revert it back. It's, again, following the philosophy of taxing the rich. Um, and so I would say, you know, this is definitely something um, to, to be aware of. A couple of things I want to, I would like to point out here, um, because I'd be remiss if I didn't. If you have not done any federal estate planning at this point, and you have levels that are, for, forget the 11 million, that are close to, let's assume it goes back to 5 million. Please reach out to someone <laughs> today. You're right, um, right. It, I can't tell you, last time when this was under consideration, accountants and estate attorneys, we were just strapped those last two weeks, right, in December for everybody who was scrambling of this might have a significant drop and I haven't planned for this yet. Um, you need to plan for it. And one of the things that the IRS has made very clear is to the extent that you do indeed um, transfer money or transfer investments or transfer assets, what what have you, during this time to take, uh, to take um, the higher exemption amount, they will not claw back at a later point in time and say that those didn't qualify for the exemption. Meaning if we're starting at 27 million for a married filing joint couple, you can arrange to utilize that full 27 million now. And when the TCGA, if the TCGA sunsets and we go back to 5 million, the IRS cannot come back and say, well, now you can't take the 22 million, right? So the ability to do a state tax planning um, is huge right now, right? It, it's so important, and we and sometimes it naturally occurs. I know this is a subject sometimes people don't like to think about, they don't like to talk about. I'm not there yet, um, but it, it really needs to be talked about and and developed over these next 18 months to make sure that you're maximizing, um, you know, this huge deduction amount that could potentially go away very quickly. Um, the other item I would point out is. The portability election is there. Um, maybe previously, you know, you didn't, you, you had real estate and now it's kind of blown up. You had a spouse pass away in the last couple of years. You never filed their estate return. Um, and so therefore their ability to give you, you know, their essentially $13 million is not valid. Um, there's a five-year look back right now in general that if you have a spouse who died in the last five years and you didn't, physically file the paperwork to transfer their exemption amount to you, um, you still have opportunity to do that. So that's another thing I'd like to point out about this subject. And then last, the estate tax rate is scheduled to go up. So right now the maximum tax rate is is 40%. Mm As soon as you exceed your full exemption amount and you hit a million dollars, that's going to jump to 45%. 
Um, it's a joke. Wow. It's a running joke only if you could control when you die, right? For time, <laughs> but she can't. Um, and so it's really important. I can't stress enough that do not delay on just picking up the phone and, and talking to your advisors about this and seeing if you, you need to be planning more so now um, for the what if scenario that this, this does sunset in 2025. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Lynn. I, I was going to say, you know, the, your point about this is a, sometimes a difficult uh, concept for folks to act on, and and we we get that. What we're talking about here is making an irrevocable gift, right? Mm -hmm. Parting away with parting, you know, with with capital that is no longer fully under my control to take advantage of these exem exemption amounts, um, and that's a that's a big thing for, for clients to do. Uh, and, and so we understand that. And I think to your point, the more that you can plan and the more that you can quantify, can I do this? Can I afford to do this? What's the impact if I don't act? Um, you know, I, I think it's really, really important. And then I think the other uh, thing to highlight that you were chatting about, Lynn, is, you know, if, if you just fast forward to, let's say next summer, we're not even in the summer of 2024 yet, but if we're in the summer of 2025, the legal community, I believe is gonna be so inundated with last minute folks doing their planning that it's gonna be hard to get in the door um, to, to actually execute on, on some of this stuff. So again, I do think it is important to uh, to at least start to have these discussions now in 2024. Uh, you know, if, if the rate goes, if the, not the rate, if the exemption goes down and the rate goes up, right? That That's a that's a big impact to families uh, that could be subject to this uh, this kind of tax. And, and, you know, the more planning you do, uh, now, I think the, the better you'll be served, even if you decide that it's not the best to be making huge gifts, at least you've, you know, evaluated the, uh, the situation to see if it's something that's right uh, for you. And a couple things, Tom, on that, I would say, um, you know, it doesn't have to be you. If you have anticipate that you're going to have highly, it usually is property, right? Highly appreciable property, right? We've seen in certain areas of the country, yeah. real estate go above and beyond what we thought it would and it will sure. continue to do so if you transfer that now right and use up some of your exemption even if you don't use it all all that appreciation that's going to grow on that stays out of your estate because it's the appreciation that happened after you transferred it in you know into into trust and now maybe when you die that land is worth 25 million but when you you put it in it was only worth five um, you've essentially kept $20 million of appreciation out of your estate. So the, it does make sense if you are anticipating highly appreciable assets um, that you own to, to, to get involved here and, and start planning earlier. That's a great point. That's, Absolutely. That's definitely where it gets exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And making sure, too, that you're keeping in mind that, you know, you're being mindful that you have enough for your own use and for your own life, you know, so making sure that it does fit in with, you know, your larger financial plan as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk more about Kate. I'm sure you know we'll probably put together an episode where we talk more about some strategies that folks can think about uh, when it comes to this part of the uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, specifically on the estate planning uh, front. Yeah, I, I think good. there are you know some really interesting things that folks can can uh, at least start to you know think about. Um, Absolutely, and I, and I reiterate yeah. what Tom said: is last time we were anticipating a shift, lawyers were not accepting clients because they were so busy. Um, so it is something to start looking at now and not waiting until next summer. Well, you know, I think a lot of people are probably going to wait until November, Lynn. <laughs> I, think, as I think what a lot of yeah. people's strategy is. So yes. maybe getting ahead of that November curve yes. uh, is probably good timing. No, no vacations the last that. three months of next year. That's right. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Lynn, this has been so insightful and so helpful um, to our listeners, to us. This has been great. Any, any final comments or closing remarks? Um, I think just don't keep your head in the sand, right? Um, we're trying, as much as we're trying to educate our congressional leaders, we're educating our clients as well. Um, ask your accountant, um, ask your financial advisor, what if we revert back to before the TCGA, what does this tax bill look like? Um, and, and really start because what we find is you can talk and educate people as to the change, but until they see the tax impact on their company or their individual sure. tax return, they do not understand it. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to, to ask your accountant. Well, and we tried to push this out um, within our firm this year as well as 
okay, well, what if these items go away? Where, what, what does your tax bill now look like? Um, the other thing I would say to you is we, we can be there and we're technically right, educating our congressional leaders daily um, as they're receiving and, and being very open to, to understanding kind of this world more if they're not well-versed in it. Um, but who they really wanna hear from is you. And they don't wanna hear anything technical. Um, they wanna hear that, um, you know, we, there's some great um, stories around farmers um, and estates, right? That they don't have cash to essentially sure. pay the tax bill. They have land, they have real estate, and they will have to convert that to pay the estate tax bill, which only in inhibits their ability, you know, to pass this on through to future generations. Right. Um, they wanna hear that story. They wanna hear that, um, you know, you have been benefiting from the 199A deduction, and now, um, you know, you're not gonna expand um, your facility. You're not gonna hire those extra 20 people. You're not gonna X, because you just can't right now, because it's too it's too unclear on, on what, you know, what business tax is gonna look like in, a year from now. So. So um, you would be surprised um, how impactful those stories are um, and how much they're needed. So whoever your representative is or your senator, even if you have never met them, even if you have to Google to say, who are they? Um, if you are going to have a, a significant impact because of these changes, tell your story. Don't get involved in the technical, not needed, but tell your story. Well That's said. great advice. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Well, Lynn, thanks again so much for your time. Uh, you can you can learn more about Lynn by going to uh, withem.com, uh, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. All right, Kate. We covered a lot of ground there. We so did. So I figured, I figured we uh, we should wrap up with some you know some closing thoughts just on some planning opportunities because there was a lot of different pieces that we um, were chatting with Lynn about everything from you know income. Uh, tax rates to deductions to, you know, estate taxes and what those exemptions look like. So, um, so let's, and, and, you know, we're not giving any blanket advice here, but just in terms of uh, broad picture things for, uh, you know, for clients and, and folks to think about. I think it's great. Yeah. I think just some takeaways, you know, for our listeners, you know, kind of what, what should folks do now to prepare for this, you know, it seems like for most folks, and obviously everyone's situation is different, but for most folks, you know, the TCJA sunset is probably going to mean higher tax bills. Um, except for Lynn, you know, Tom and I are not CPAs, so certainly meeting with your, you know, tax advisors to review how the sunset might affect your particular situation and what it might mean to that, just as Lynn was saying, that bottom line tax bill. I think that's when folks really feel it, Tom, when oh my gosh, this, this could mean $10,000 more in taxes. This could mean X more in taxes. I think that's when folks will really start to feel it. Um, so just, you know, going through those numbers and kind of putting some figures on paper. Yeah. And, you know, I guess the other thing is we should probably assign some probability, right, to, to the outcomes that Lynn was talking about. And just to highlight that again, you know, she was saying the three main outcomes are it does sunset. We go back to where sure. we were prior to the tax act, in which case rates are higher, but things like itemized deductions are back. Uh, things like you could be subject to AMT. Uh, at the end of the day, there could be you know higher tax liabilities. Uh, they could they could kick the can down the road, which they've been famous for doing do on a lot of the other that. issues, right? <laughs> yes. And so, therefore, you know, how many more years could they kick the can down the road? I don't know. We definitely live in a very short political cycle and we're in an election year and then oh by the way there's going to be midterm elections come after the act is set to expire so yep. you know that could be one and the other one could be major we get major tax reform between now and the end of next year and that's probably in my opinion at least probably the lowest probability i would agree um, tom yeah because that would that would mean major bipartisan you know cooperation and getting a lot of these big changes into place right which is really hard to do uh, uh on on let's say you know smaller uh topics never mind um you know tax reform here in, in the us but if we assume that rates will be higher come 2026 certainly folks could think about you know maybe accelerating um some income these next two years 24 and 25 Definitely. And that could include things like Roth conversions. Yeah. And I would say, you know, rule, as we've said before, and I love this expression, you know, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Right. 
Sure. Make sure that some of these items, these, you know, are going to fit into your overall plan. Um, I know that the threat of higher taxes does make folks nervous, but, you know, two things are certain in life, right? And taxes is one of them. And, you know, we know that those, those changes in taxes will happen along the way. So just, just some food for thought. And again, making sure that you're reviewing your plan and discussing these items with advisors, but yeah, maybe, maybe pulling forward some income. And this doesn't mean necessarily W-2 income, but, you know, maybe it's Roth conversions. You know, how do, would that fit into your overall plan already? So, you know, maybe using these historically low interest rate, uh, historically low rates, you know, as an opportunity for doing so. Um, and then just, you know, maximizing maybe contributions to Roth IRAs, as you mentioned, and Roth 401ks. More and more plans, we're seeing um, that Roth 401k option as well. Sure. Right. If, if income is going to be higher down the road, if rates are going to be higher, perhaps we do it now rather than down the road. Take advantage of this window, if you will. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because obviously no one knows for sure. And a lot could happen out of Washington from now between then. But just sure. knowing that this is you know, a possible, a possible uh, you know, change. And then you know, along the estate planning, too, you know, I know those numbers that we went over, Tom, are big numbers. So a lot of folks aren't going to to uh, necessarily be impacted by this, but many are. So, and again, really making sure that you're reviewing with your estate planner, re reviewing with your financial planner to make sure that you still have access to the amount of funds that you need to live. Because as you had mentioned, these gifts to irrevocable trusts are just that. So making sure that you have access to enough funds um, to you know, live out your days. And paying attention to where you're domiciled. You know, we're talking about the federal yeah. exemption amounts, but, you know, there's there's lots of states that have their own state estate taxes and planning, of course, should be done in conjunction with, you know, whatever the laws are in your particular state and making sure that you're taking advantage of the, um, you know, the, the best the best way to pass assets to your heirs, uh, your, your loved ones and even charity, depending on, um, you know, what your what your state rules look like. So just want to make sure that we mentioned that part of it. Um, and from a, I think just from how do I benefit from the potential uh, decrease in that in that exemption amount? You know, I, one of the phrases that we continue to hear and one of the things that we had on the slide there is that is that term bonus exemption. And that's really, sure. you know, if you think about, you know, what we're dealing with here, it's how do I take advantage of how much higher it is right now compared to where it's going to be? come 2026 if, if, you know, if it does sunset. So, you know, sure. I think, I think thinking about that part of it, not just making a gift, but it's, a, but it's, it's, it's taking advantage of this bonus amount where if you do execute any of this planning, what's really going to matter, what's going to, what's going to, you know, change the bottom line. It's really going to be folks that are able to um, gift away that, that bonus amount where they're going to see the benefits because there will be no clawback. You know, the IRS came out with that, um, uh, and, and basically, you know, told taxpayers, listen, you don't have to worry about this part uh, of, of the law at this point. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was helpful. And then, you know, the rates are going to change on a lot of these things, including what the, what the, you know, the estate tax would be. Lynn pointed out, could, we could move from 40 to 45%. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And the other, the other thing, you know, we, we, we spent some time on here is like this relationship between the standard deduction and itemized deductions. Mm -hmm. And I guess, one of the one of the takeaways here would be just to pay attention to a lot of those underlying classic itemized deductions that could be back on the table come 2026. And, you know, I, I guess the advice would be to, you know, have you know clients and individuals just make sure that they're paying attention to what that looks like uh, so that they set themselves up for, OK, am I better off taking that itemized deduction or sticking with whatever the standard deduction might settle to? at that point in the future. Um, and that would include everything from mortgage interest, right? The home prices are a whole lot higher. People are potentially borrowing more um, to uh, to move or to buy their buy their first homes, things like that. People that are moving out of uh, urban areas and stuff like that. So I think yeah, that's- Yeah, take some planning. Yeah, take some that's, planning and, and maintaining, you know, keeping track of the potential deductions and then keeping those receipts and keeping track of it all. And we know that, you know, the tax rules are always going to be changing. And, you know, I know we kind of joked and um, but, you know, the one thing that certain is that it will uh, be uncertain. Right. That's the one thing that we can be certain about. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately. Right. Yes. So, you know, obviously just keeping keeping abreast of any changes and, um, 
you know, trying, trying to keep a level of flexibility. And I always like to recommend a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice yes. uh, in the face of if all possible. these changes that if possible uh, when it comes be to coming taxes. down the pike. Um, yes. And I, yeah, I think maybe finally just having folks pay attention to the short term impact here versus the longer term knowing that a decision you make now can have a ripple effect, right? It can affect what happens down, um, down the line and into the future. And to your point about, you know, not just not knowing right beyond yeah. these next couple of years, that's a, you know, that, that's a, that's a short term, uh, scenario for sure. And, you know, we can do our best to extrapolate what tax rates might look like in the future, but it's probably safe to assume that, um, you know, rates will likely be a bit higher, uh, in the future. So we'll, you know, we'll keep that in mind when we're having conversations with, uh, you know, with, with clients and our colleagues. Definitely. Well, I think today was a great session. Um, I hope all of our listeners enjoyed. Um, Lynn was a great guest. I hope to have her back at some point. Um, so just want to say thanks to all of our viewers and to our listeners uh, for joining us today. And we'd love you to like and subscribe. Absolutely. Yeah, right. If you're watching us on YouTube, uh, make sure you, you uh, subscribe. Uh, we plan to continue to push out uh, new episodes uh, every month and, um, and follow us uh, wherever you get your podcast, whether it be Apple or Google. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're excited for the future. Great. Hope to see you back soon. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Tom. Take care.